Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here again, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. We have a single cut uh, PRS that we're doing a refret on, so we're going to slip all those frets out, we're going to a higher profile fret. And as always, the Patreon subscribers will get a complete A to Z play by play. We also have this 1929 Gibson L5 that's in, and we'll be installing the pick guard on this one. Now I've already done quite a bit of work on this one, it was a complete refret and all the inlay was replaced it was all crumbling and falling out and I made a new foot for that bridge for those of you who follow my channel you would have saw the video on that so the customer has come back with this guitar because the pick guard was missing original pick guard was missing and we're going to put this uh, retrofit one on for him Danny's a long time customer and uh, he's uh, quite a guitar collector like a lot of my clients this 29 L5 is one of two L5s that he has a 34 and a 29 and we'll give you the play-by-play, -play, as always. Cheers. So we give this just a little, little touch of heat before we lift it out. Get them out nice and clean. There's a couple of corrections in the fingerboard that we'll be doing as well once we have the frets out. And of course, like you've heard me say in other videos, this is the one of the big advantages of doing a refret is especially after the guitar has been around for a while and done whatever movement it's going to do as far as the wood especially the neck to body junction then this kind of puts you in the driver's seat because you can correct the fingerboard Well, John, this is for you. Uh, you were asking about the uh, Japanese uh, razor saw, and this is what I use to open up the fret slots. And I got this at the local uh, KW Surplus store here in town. If I remember correctly, I think it was $8.95. When you measure the saw, you want to measure across the tooth set. So this is 22.5 thou. Absolutely perfect for fret work. I kind of hit that on the disc sander really lightly and kind of put that negative cant on there and the reason I did that is so that I can drop into the fret slot and again you know the Japanese saws are beautiful because they cut on the pull stroke so this fingerboard is actually bound we have to tee out the frets and I'll kind of show you that as we go cutting on the pull stroke like that it allows me to drop in right tight to the binding and then pull back and make sure that we get these slots cleaned out right to the very edge so that the frets seat perfectly. There's the sanding block I use so it's basically in this case it's uh, oak, a piece of oak jointed. There's a slip of leather on that jointed face, two-sided tape and then another slip of two-sided tape on the leather and then this 120 grit adheres to that. All I did was just lightly go over this board. There were a couple of spots up here that needed to be corrected. Of course, I adjusted the truss rod first to get the lay of the neck perfect. So in this case, I just used this four and three quarter inch sanding block because there was a high spot here on the treble side and then a high spot here at the neck to body junction on the base side only. So I just went over that gently and then I checked it with the straight edge. So I checked this all the way across with the straight edge and it is perfect. So we've got adjustability left in the truss rod, lay of the neck is perfect, now we put our frets in. So I've got a loop of this uh, Jaskar fret wire, now this is uh, 151. Now I also have a piece of high density foam that I've double sided tape to this side of the upper neck platform. I'm pre-cutting all the frets slightly oversized. I don't necessarily do it this way every time, but I think for the for your sake, the, your, the Patreon uh, subscribers, uh, I thought this might illustrate everything a little bit better. 
one, two, three, four, and five. Kind of losing my place here. Okay, so all of these frets are cut slightly oversized in there. Neck to body junction. So you can see I'm I'm kind of lining these all up first so that uh, they're in order. And again, cutting them just a little proud. I want to leave the overhang and I'll show you the original frets so that you can see. So I cut clean through. Now you want to cut through the depth of the fret. Don't cut it sideways because you'll crush the crown. Cut from the bottom of the fret to the top. So I'm checking that again. This is our the last fret we're putting in and I want to make sure that I leave enough for the overhang and then I'll clip this one back. So that's the undercut on the original frets. So we want to make sure that we leave a bit better than that on the replacement frets. So we'll leave pretty well close to twice that amount to begin with when we put the new frets in. Okay, what I've got here is I've got a, a, a chunk of ultra high molecular density plastic that I've obviously just clamped to the upper platform of the tech deck. I, I don't normally do this, I'm really doing this for you guys, for the camera. So I'll bring you to the next stage now on these frets. Now this is an old set of uh, Klein uh, nippers that I, I got many, many years ago. I've got a couple of these left and that just sort of clips off the tang. Now there's a I know that the folks at Jess Carr have a wonderful looking tool. I haven't used it myself yet, but uh, the Klein ones are no longer available, believe it or not. I don't know why. I thought they were a great tool. And I cut that back just a little bit more. So we want to make sure that we can comfortably get that tang into the slot in between the binding on both sides. That's where we're after with this. Now, I know a lot of people don't go to this extent, but I like to actually take off every trace of the leftover bit of that extrusion after clipping. Other side, same thing. There's a couple of reasons I leave that extra overhang more than we need. That extra overhang allows me to actually grab that cantilevered section of the crown and bend back slightly. Now what that does is it guarantees that outside edge to be good and tight against the fingerboard. So just grab the end of it and gently ply it down. I also grab the fret itself and just put a slight overbend in it. When I drive it home those outside edges are good and tight. So you can see that we've got a little bit of extra overhang there. This is what I do next. I have my 12 inch disc sander on a foot pedal. I give that a spin and just, just bring that back a little bit more. Obviously we still want it proud of the fingerboard. I can even put the bevel on with that disc. So this is actually still oversized. So next I hit that end on the buffer just to, just to smooth it out. So when I finally get to the edge dress, the file will just bless over that end. Five strokes. One, two, three, four, five. sure that you do notch out enough. You don't want to start pushing the binding off when you drive the fret in, so that's what we want. Here's a tip for all of the long-time tech deck guys, guys that bought them 10 years ago. 
Um, I don't think I've actually shown this in a video before, but I have a piece of hockey puck that I put underneath the rail, the pivoting rail on this side. I do that just for the last two frets and that allows you to seat those top two frets good and firm. So watch how easily, quickly and accurately this edge dress goes because of all that extra work we put into preparing those fret ends and buffing them out. Like I've said in other videos, you know, when you get to this point, it's so close. We're talking a few thou here. It's, it's really a matter of listening rather than looking. So you can kind of, you can hear that file grabbing right now, still grabbing a little bit. And you'll hear that file go from a, from a crunch to a whisper. And it's, we're there. See that? No resistance. And that is it. Done. This side, same deal. Just get it started. didn't leave much protruding out on this and this allows you to get that edge dress done super accurate and super quick and eliminating the danger of loosening those frets on the outside edge which is typically where they loosen up and, and again you listen to that file you, you'll hear it go from sort of a crunch to a whisper when we arrive Still grabbing a little bit. And that. And that. That's it. We're done. Still need to buff it out yet. Okay, we are back to this 1929 L5 uh, pick guard. I'm going to be sort of putting that together and I'll bring you into the loop on that as well. But before we do, we have this PRS guitar that's getting a compensated nut. Now this is actually uh, water buffalo tusk that uh, I got a chunk of this years ago from a customer that had picked it up at a garage sale. The nice thing about the water buffalo tusk is that it has sort of inherent oils so it doesn't stick like the injection molded plastic nut. The complete fret job is done. I have leveled those frets on the outside edge. I haven't buffed them out yet. That'll be next. We'll give you step by step on that. So that's my little platform that I used for uh, filing the leftover extrusion flush with the underside of the crown. Yeah, I just sort of clip it onto that upper neck uh, platform and that seemed to work pretty good. I really just did it to get a better camera angle, but I think I'm going to use that trick again. I've got my 400 grit and we're just going circular motion, circular motion, and then the opposite direction just to clean up those fret ends. We've got a beautiful bevel on that all the way along. Got it dead flush, so now we're using the lighter sandpaper just to kind of get rid of any edges. Now we will finish with the buffer, but we're starting with this 400 grit. Same deal on this side to the fresh, uh, fresh piece of sandpaper. Again, 400 grit, kind of circular motion initially, and then just go in the opposite direction, circular motion. And again, and then full length. And I'm pretty happy with that. So we're just about ready to do our final leveling along the length and our final buff. And then we'll get back to that compensated nut. I've gone along the length of that neck and you can hear, see how I move obliquely? I'm actually keeping the, the file in line with the string path and moving obliquely across the neck to sort of check it for straightness. And that does not get any straighter than that. So we did correct the high spot here. There was a high spot here as well. But we corrected that when we had the frets out. New frets are in. We barely grazed over them. So now we're ready to buff and polish. And this is why you take that opportunity when the frets are out to correct the fingerboard. Get the fingerboard perfect. Then when the new frets go in, well, they don't need much. Now what I am doing... I'm softening that cross-sectional profile of the end of the fret where we went along with the mill file to level. So you want to soften that so there's no snags or jags. And I'm doing that with the 400 grit. 
and I've already got my block loaded up with a couple of pieces of 600. So we're going to follow up with that and then we'll buff. Yeah, Chris will notice a huge difference in this guitar. He was having problems with it splatting out and buzzing. And those problems are gone forever now. Second pass with 600 grit. And we're ready to buff. It's a quick way to just take out any trace or scratch marks from when we leveled, leveled the fingerboard. So the whole job is complete now and I'm just scraping that inlay nice and clean. A couple of strokes with the razor blade. Now I'll go over it one last time with the steel wool. And that is fret job completed. So before we string this up, for the customer, they want to see consistency along the edge of that fret job. So you want everything to look uniform. So I have both pickups taped right off, so there's zero chance of any filings getting in the pickups. So we've got that smooth right out. Little dab of this ebony compound liquid compound on a cloth. Just kind of dab it on there all the way along and rub it out. And that is going to give us a beautiful consistent sheen along the full edge of that fingerboard. So when the customer goes to inspect your fret job, he's going to see perfection along that edge. Tape comes off and voila. And now we're ready for strings and we'll touch up that compensating nut. It's a beautiful thing. So you just lightly oil that fingerboard and again like I've said so many times before you wipe it on, wipe it off. Okay, we're ready to string it up. So you've got a Tone Pro bridge on here. I've got to set it up initially and see whether we're going to need to bring it up or bring it down as far as action goes. So we'll get it strung up first and tuned to concert pitch and we'll check it from there. So this PRS is essentially done but there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. I ended up filing a slight relief cut in the back of that bridge casting because that G-string was flopping around. There wasn't enough bite at the focal point on the saddle. This one is good now. This one is good. The D is good. But if you look closely at the A, see how I, I move that and it kind of slops around? I'm going to notch that out ever so slightly, but I may end up relieving the, the back of that bridge casting for this string as well. Same with the low E. See how it's kind of moving? You want it to lock in to its designated notch for a couple of reasons. Mostly for intonation purposes, but also to line the strings up properly with the pickups. So I'm going to work these two saddles. I don't want to lower the depth. I'm just going to file off the back edge a little tiny bit and then check it again 
to see that it indexes properly in that notch without slopping around like that. That first string, I can see that someone's taken a run at it, you know, the chrome has been filed off. I can see that string sort of jump when I hit it. Same with the low E. It's moving laterally across the focal point on the saddle. Not a good thing. So I'm going to notch both those saddles ever so slightly so that they index firmly into their perspective slots. So as often happens, a little bit of re-engineering is in order here and this is what I've done is I've cut a relief cut in the back of that wraparound casting so that the focal point on the saddle in relation to that wraparound is actually higher and that gives us the downward pressure we need for that string to notch firmly into its designated slot in the saddle. As you can see, I've got a piece of masking tape to sort of guide the file on both sides. Well, we've still got lateral movement. We need to relieve the back of that wraparound even more. I'm showing you this because I've come across this before. It's better, but still not enough. Pretty close call here. You got to make sure you don't actually hit the focal point on the saddle itself when you're filing. We're almost there, but that still wasn't quite enough. Let's check it again. Okay, good. I'm happy with that. Next, we'll go to the A string. Gonna mask that off. It's the same deal here. That's just slopping around. It is not indexing in the saddle. If my memory serves me well, I remember doing a VOS Melody Maker and I'm pretty sure that uh, Tone Pro had put relief cuts all the way across into the casting. So when, when the bridge was cast it already had those relief cuts in because obviously it is a problem. This is still not indexing as firmly as I would like to see it. Uh, it's still too loose. So what I'm doing is I'm not deepening the slot, I'm cutting back the back half of the saddle so that the string goes right to the leading edge. This is a retrofit bridge. It's not the original bridge that came with the guitar. That's what we're after. So now you can see each string all the way across is firmly indexed into the slot in the saddle. I want to illustrate this. I purposely left that string out of its notch. You need to move that over until it clicks in. Did you hear that? This one too. There we go. That one's in. That one's in. Okay, now we tune the guitar. Here's our final wrap up. We've got the Buffalo Tusk all new frets. We corrected the fingerboard and then all of the sort of re-engineering we did on that bridge to get that to behave itself. It's now perfectly in tune. Let's go plug it in and have a listen. Probably mix it up a little bit and do something in F minor. To C minor 9. Just sort of back and forth between uh, F minor 9 and C minor 9. And then So the turnaround is just two G diminished chord inversions. And then back to the F minor. So it sounds like this. that it's kind of a an F harmonic minorish kind of thing that I'm doing. I remember Chris saying that he really liked the pickups and you know something I can see why they're like searing. Anyways enjoy
The second string I played the note G, the eighth fret. <laughs> <laughs> 